didn't like it earlier. like it or okay now i'm not going to hear myself double <laughs> i knew it was going to do that okay oh. everybody thank you for your patience um i'm back in my house <laughs> for the first time in about six weeks doing these programs and so i've had to kind of get reacclimated to my pandemic setup but i want to welcome everyone to pictorial companion to getting ahead of Arkansas snakes. This is a program of the Cows Encyclopedia of Arkansas. I'm Heather Register Zabendon, the outreach coordinator for the Bobby L. Roberts Library of Arkansas History and Art. The Roberts Library ha houses the galleries at Library, of, sorry, the galleries and bookstore at Library Square. That's a new develop, new-ish development. The Butler Center for Arkansas. Arkansas Studies, and the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. So please go to robertslibrary.org for all of the details about visiting us. This program is part of a series entitled Arkansas Animals Real and Imagined, and it's part of our 2021 summer reading offerings. This year's summer reading club theme is Tales and Tales, so T-A-I-L-S and T-A-L-E-S. And our branches are offering programs and activities for all ages. This program is being live streamed to YouTube, which actually worked today, and will be available to view on the CALS YouTube channel immediately following. The speaker will answer questions at the end of the session and you'll be able to type your questions in the chat box in Zoom. So now for tonight's program. We're joined by Stan Trouth, herpetologist and professor of zoology and environmental studies at, the, at Arkansas State University. Stan joined the faculty of ASU in 1984 and served as associate editor, managing editor, and then editor in chief of the Journal of Arkansas Academy of Science. Journal of the Arkansas Academy of Science from 1993 through 2008. He served as president elect and president of the Arkansas Academy of Science from 2004 to 2005. And he is wild, widely published, he might be wildly published too, widely published in scientific journals on biology, uh, on the biology of Arkansas amphibians and reptiles. And this work culminated in a book published in 2004, The Amphibians and Reptiles of Arkansas, which was co-authored by his colleagues, Drs. Henry W. Robson and Michael V. Plummer. He has served as the director of ASU's electron microscope facility for 30 years, and he wrote a novel for young people, Salamandria, published in 2015 with his wife, Joy. So everybody, please give a warm welcome to the snake lover, Stan. Well, thank you, Heather. And good evening, everyone. I'm happy to uh, be able to talk to you a little tonight about one of my favorite groups of animals. I have several within that category of herpetology. But to start with, I wanted to Give you a little background about myself. If I can see, I can barely see all the things I have placed on my PowerPoint because there are all kinds of bars here. But anyway, uh, I'm going to uh, mention that I uh, moved to Arkansas when I was seven years old. My parents bought a resort in out, outside of uh, Mountain Home on Bull Shoals Lake. And when as a kid, I used to go uh, chasing collared lizards. Um, when I was uh, old enough to do that and to run those animals down, uh, often being bitten by the, the collared lizards in the process. I uh, went to Mountain Home High School and played sports, all sports there. And in particular, 1966, our, uh, excuse me, our uh, basketball team, senior high basketball team, won the state uh, tournament toward uh, 2A at that time. And I'm pictured in the uh, 
photo on the right, even though I can't see it. Um, there is a bar over it right now there. I uh, received my BS and MS degrees from the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville, and then a PhD at Auburn University in 1980. And as uh, Heather mentioned, I've been a faculty member, or was a faculty member at Arkansas State for 33 years. And so I wanna say a little more about myself. Uh, the pictures that you'll see in this, forward to the actual talk are uh, selections that I thought might be of interest and maybe we could talk about or I could talk about it and you might show some interest in our uh, um, question and answer later. So on the left, lower left, there is one of my uh, pictures of me digging up lizards. And that, that's something I did for, for many, many years and still do. I have the, uh, the, the technique down so I can go out during the wintertime with snow on the ground and can, I can pick a site along a uh, highway in Arkansas and actually two out of three times I can, I can dig up lizards, surprisingly. I also studied salamanders and down on the lower right shows me uh, in my wetsuit in the Spring River. And uh, at that time we were looking for hellbenders. And I did some work with hellbenders for uh, several years. And let's move to the next slide. All right, here we go. And here, of course, my my love of lizards, really my first love. Uh, in the upper middle there, you see the collared lizards there, male and female. That particular photo, I had to crawl on my belly uh, on hot sandstone near Calico Rock uh, to get that photograph is one that I'm proud of that I was able to get. Uh, they're not easy to, uh, to get the animals um, when they'll stay together like that very often. And on the lower bottom is the prairie race runner, that lizard that I can dig up anytime I want to any, in about 22 states, I've dug them out of the ground. Uh, on the far right is a book that I co-authored with several colleagues on the reproductive biology and phylogeny of lizards and the tuatara. Tuatara, as you might know, is from New Zealand. So that those are, I'm holding a collared lizard on the left over there. The way you collect them or, or um, pick them up is to noose them. And uh, that's, that's an easy technique. Now, as far as salamanders go, I mentioned the uh, hellbender, which is on the right over uh, on the right of your screen. Also uh, on the left is the Western slimy salamander. For about 16 years, I visited a mine shaft down near Hot Springs. And uh, I did it for three or four times a year uh, for the first five or six years. And then once or twice after that, uh, the uh, mine shaft you can see on the lower left. And that particular mine shaft <clears throat> became a very uh, important site because um, one of my grad students contacted the BBC and uh, mentioned that there was this mine shaft that his major professor studied salamanders in. And it turns out that the BBC was interested and Sir David Attenborough came to visit uh, for three days, and uh, that was very exciting, needless to say. Um, I uh, was able to take one photograph of him, and I still cherish that photo. But uh, otherwise, uh, the photos of Sir David and me and, and others there were taken by my wife, Joy. Now, on the lower right is um, the and we'll say that it's a middle grade book, but it's a uh, it's for all ages, really. And uh, Salamandria came to my mind after working in the mine shaft many years, and so it's a it's a tale of how salamanders uh, escaped a uh, herpetarium and a zoo, and they uh, made it back. Some of them did anyway to the mine shaft, where 
the uh, the couple slimies lay their eggs. And you can see on the upper right, or upper left rather, a slimy salamander with her egg clutch. So that was very exciting times. I, uh, as Heather mentioned, I was director of the electron microscope facility at ASU. And there on the left, uh, I'm sitting behind that electron microscope. It allowed me to do a number of studies that were very uh, interesting, uh, including snake reproductive anatomy. And so I uh, uh, took uh, advantage of being uh, the, uh, the director of the facility, but also being able to do research with my students and, and me uh, over the years. Well, besides lizards and salamanders, I also study turtles. And I studied the alligator snapping turtle for 20 years. And talk about excitement, nothing quite like picking up that large animal and knowing that if you didn't handle him right, he could put a bad bite on you. So um, I enjoyed doing the work with the alligator snapping turtle though for those years and have published my uh, results several papers on those. Uh, well, one of the advantages of doing that kind of work is here again, a grad student contacts uh, the Discovery Channel and says, hey, uh, I've got a professor that studies alligator snapping turtles. Would uh, Mike R uh, Rowe want to come up and visit? So I was contacted by their uh, micros group. And I said, well, you need to, it needs to be two days and they said, no, uh, we can only come for one day. And I didn't hear from, from them for another year. <laughs> but they contacted me again and said, okay, well, we're willing to come. Just could, are there any other things you could do uh, while we're at ASU to, uh, that we could record? And so it wasn't just me going, taking Mike after alligator snapping turtles. He also got into uh, cow dung and also got into um, a, a chamber in one of the, 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 the uh, cow's uh, stomachs that the egg right uh, farm. <laughs> anyway, they got three, three different recordings out of the, that three day or two day session, basically. So anyway, uh, excitement with micro was sort of neat. And I, I have this already mentioned and maybe most of you know about the uh, Amphibians and Reptiles of Arkansas. Uh, it's a book that can uh, educate you, uh, entertain you. It's got lots of photos. I took, there's uh, 556 photos and I took all but eight of them uh, in the book. So it's, it's certainly a good guide to have if you have any interest in those animals in Arkansas. So here we go. Um, I was in North Carolina and uh, they happened to see a rat snake uh, at a meeting and I went over and picked it up and immediately got bitten by the snake. But I, I wanted to, to hold it up and a few people took pictures of it. And, uh, and so that's how I'm starting out uh, my talk uh, this evening about snakes. Now, yeah, it's a play with words getting ahead of Arkansas snakes. And as you will see, that's exactly what I meant. Here are the first, first uh, slide of snakes of Arkansas, only their heads basically. And this group of snakes, some of the larger snakes we have, like the rat snake in A and the uh, Great Plains rat snake in B, those are fairly large snakes. The, uh, the, uh, king, the prairie king snake is a large snake and whatever else is to its right, I can't see it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'll skip on down. Uh, on the left though, are the uh, two milk snakes that we have. One is the Eastern milk snake. And if you look at the head of the Eastern milk snake, you can see that it uh, has a black, blackish head. And if you look at the, uh, that's the Western. 
this is the eastern milk snake below it. It's sort of got a red head. So that's one of the ways you can immediately know the difference between the two species. But uh, where you collect it is very important too. I mean, if you collect in the eastern part of the state, you're going to get the eastern milk snake. If you're in the western part of the state, you're probably going to see the western milk snake. And then this uh, lower one on the right, well, the king snake, I think most of the people uh, probably listening uh, are familiar with the king snake. Excuse me. The one on uh, the lowest in H, that's a uh, variable, it's called a variable ground snake. And there are about three sites in Arkansas where you can find them. Unfortunately, my class and I found one of the sites. So anyway, let's move on to the next slide. Talk about an interesting group of snakes. The racers are by far uh, one, of the, one of my favorites. And so in the uh, A and B there, what you see are in A is the adult uh, coach whip. And then on the right in B, that's the juvenile. And their, their heads and their coloration look totally different from one another. Then, then in C is the uh, black mask racer. And in uh, D, which I can't see, I know it's there though, it's the uh, Eastern yellow bellied racer. And then in E is the Southern black racer. And then F is the buttermilk racer. I mean, we have uh, all these racers in Arkansas and they, they're very uh, difficult to, to collect, uh, especially when they're warmed up and they just, they, they take off. Uh, probably a lot faster than say a rat snake would. A rat snake is gonna hang around. And so the, the reason I mention that is that the racers, or at least the um, Southern black racer, which is the most common one we have in central Arkansas here, uh, is black. So some people think, well, there, there's a, a rat snake. You know, well, no, it's the uh, Southern black racer. Uh, the uh, coach whip in A there, that snake can get up to uh, seven feet in length. It's our longest snake. And what's interesting about the, uh, the uh, coach whip is that if you corner it, box it in, it'll get up like a cobra does and, and look at you just like that, like a cobra would, uh, just a, as a defensive behavior. And it's, it's really interesting to see him do that. All right, moving on to the next slide. Uh, the water snakes. These are the most maligned snakes we have because every, every water snake is a cotton mouth uh, by some people. And so, but you see there, uh, five of these are your typical water snakes. The uh, Mississippi green water snake, a little bit different head wise than say the, uh, yeah, uh, the plain belly or the broad banded or what's ever under here, which I can't see, which is, uh, that is the, uh, oh, that's the, uh, the uh, diamondback water snake, very common one we have, diamondback water snake. And then the one that is most common in the Arkansas Ozarks and uh, in the Washtos too, in the uh, aquatic habitats is your, uh, your uh, what is it? Sipidon, that's your common midland water snake. You know, I, I should know all of this, sort of blocked out here, I can't see. The lower ones, uh, F, uh, G, and H, these are crayfish eating snakes. Uh, the uh, Graham's crayfish snake is F, then this, this other, this gulf swamp snake, very uncommon, but occurs in most of the uh, rivers and streams in the southern part of the state, you just don't see it much. And then a real special snake, the in H is the queen snake. Now the queen snake occurs in only rivers that flow south out of the Ozark Mountains. They flow south. And so that means, uh, you know, like the Mulberry River, very uh, uh, excellent example where you're trying to queen snake. And of course, queen snakes are protected. 
And it turns out that queen snakes are disjunct in Arkansas. That is, in the eastern part of the country, there are populations of queen snakes. But you go about 500 um, kilometers where there are no queen, uh, queen snakes at all until you get into the Arkansas Ozarks and those streams that flow south, uh, Cadron Creek, uh, Big Piney, and others. So interesting snake, but protected. And they all eat, they, they all eat crayfish. Here's a hodgepodge of smaller snakes and uh, interesting snakes, color-wise. Uh, the rough green snake on the upper left there is a common snake we see in aquatic habitats. And then the, in B, which is the, uh, oops, uh, is the uh, scarlet snake, sometimes confused with uh, milk snakes. But if you look at the snout on that scarlet snake, sort of point it up, sort of point it up. It feeds on the eggs of lizards and other small snakes. And it is very uncommon. I probably have not collected more than a half a dozen personally in my life in Arkansas. And then the uh, one that a lot of people like to uh, talk about uh, probably the most is a hognose snake. Because what the hognose snake will do if perturbed, it'll roll over on its back and stick out its tongue and play dead, basically, or pretend like it's injured or whatever. And uh, you can touch the snake when it's uh, right side up, it'll turn over on its back. And then if you walk away, it'll go right, it'll get back on its belly. Then you walk up to it, it'll flip over on its back again. It's a great way. It's called death feeding. And uh, they're, they're great. They're great to watch them do that. And of course, the hook nose uh, on the uh, snout gives the uh, hog nose away. The, uh, and I'm not sure there's a, uh, see a uh, mud snake in there, which I can, can't see. Mud snakes are interesting. They're, they can be quite large and they have brilliant uh, belly patterns. But the, 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 the mud snake will not bite you. He will not bite you, he or she will not bite you. He just, you can touch its head, you can grab it by the head, you can do anything, it will not bite. Interesting snake. Compare that with this uh, garter snake here in E. Talk about wanting to bite you. If you grab that snake, it's wanting, it's wanting a piece of you immediately. And so uh, garter snakes, even though they're fairly small, not more than uh, two to three feet in length, they, they are ready for action when you collect one. Uh, I might add, as I'm, I'm going through all of these, uh, is that I realize that most of you would like to see the whole snake. But the fact is that when you look at snakes, you, you don't look at their heads enough. You don't realize that they're looking at you. They, uh, they have personality by doing that. So my, what I've done in and over a number of years is to photograph the heads of the snakes and hope to use that uh, in a, uh, maybe in some kind of book coming up. The uh, comparison between the uh, garter snake in E and then the, the ribbon snake in, in F, those are confused often. Often, uh, but you can tell the difference if the animals are in hand uh, by the, uh, number of scales that occur on the dorsal lateral stripe from the belly. Like one has three where the stripe is, one has four scales where the stripe goes. So anyway, it's a, it's a way you can tell them apart, uh, but most of the time you can do it anyway. The lower three, G, H, and I are all uh, brown snakes, uh, related to brown snake, the red belly snake is a brown snake. Uh, relative, but they're really tiny. And I mentioned the, uh, let's see, it's the uh, H here. Uh, now at I, that snake is very common around houses. Very common. My uh, former major professor at Arkansas, he and I published a paper 
just recently on the commonality of finding uh, these uh, brown snakes around buildings, around houses, dwellings. They're a slug eater and uh, they're really tiny and they're not going to harm anybody. Uh, yeah, I'm doing time-wise. Uh, okay, here's, here, here's another set of small snakes that um, are always curious to people because when they're uh, raking uh, the leaves in the, uh, especially in the spring, they may turn up one of these worm snakes. Uh, you have an Eastern and a Midwestern worm snake or Western and a Midwestern. The Midwestern only occurs on Crowley's Ridge. And it's re related to uh, snakes on the East side of the Mississippi. So that sort of tells you that at one time, the Mississippi River flowed to the west of, of Crowley's Ridge. And so that makes the connection with, with those snakes. And then the, uh, the uh, Western worm snake, just very, very common. Uh, not gonna bite, uh, but what they will do is they have a little pointed tip to their tails and they'll get that tail flipping back and forth and be poking at you. And people uh, tend to uh, be frightened by that. Heather, <laughs> frightened by that. Anyway, they, they can be somewhat frightening. And I can't see what this snake is below the bar here. It's, uh, oh, it's a earth snake. And then the, to the left of it in C is a the smallest snake in Arkansas, which is uh, Tantilla, the flathead snake. Uh, it is, rarely gets over, 12 inches, rarely. Most of the, most of the time, eight, eight to 10 inches in length and uh, very common in the springtime. And if you look at them, you know, they're, they're nondescript, sort of a grayish color. Uh, compare that to the uh, ringneck snake down here. Everybody knows what a ringneck is because you look at the neck and it's got this red or yellowish band around its neck. You know, that's an easy one. Yeah. Sometimes ringnecks like to bite you if they can, but they, they, they're, they're so small, they can't do any harm. And then the one on the lower right is the smooth earth snake, uh, very uh, similar to the uh, rough earth snake right above it, uh, but has smooth scales versus keeled scales there. So even though the, uh, the entire animal is not there, you, you sort of know what they are based on the uh, scales they look like. Now the last group of snakes, I believe, we finally got to those that tend to give people the jitters. Uh, of course, they're at the top and we have our copperhead. Uh, and then on the left in C, that's the cotton mouth. Uh, a bar, a black bar through the eye of the cotton mouse usually is a dead giveaway this one doesn't show it quite well but that's a dead giveaway and uh <clears throat> of course everybody i think knows what a copperhead looks like or should now beneath the bar which i can't see i believe as a is a uh, timber rattler and then the next two down are western diamondbacks uh i've collected two western diamondbacks in arkansas that's it they're very, very uncommon because they occur in the highland regions and very are very secretive. And uh, they just, you just don't see them very often. Uh, the coral snake, I've never found a live coral snake in Arkansas. In the Southern counties down uh, near uh, Camden and then that area, uh, the sandy areas down there in the pine forest they occur down there. I've looked for them before and never found one. And the last snake I'm going to have on this plate anyway is the uh, pygmy rattler um, found in the Ozarks and the Washtaws, not in the eastern delta area, but uh, they don't get very big, maybe a foot and a half in length, tiny venomous snakes. So these are the venomous snakes most people are concerned about and uh, are worried about, put it per se. 
the last slide, this is a summary of everybody uh, showing you, all, these are all the snakes of Arkansas by their heads. <laughs> uh, quite variable. And uh, most people learn their snakes by other, other means, by looking at the whole animal. But this is a different way of uh, enjoying snakes. Now I can see the, the yellow-bellied racer. The racers are so, <coughs> excuse me, distinctive. And these are called subspecies, the lower four there. Uh, and probably will be elevated to species level someday. I'm not sure when, but they are very distinct, but yet they can interbreed. And uh, because they can do that, they are, they remain as, as subspecies. Okay, uh, I'm looking at them all. Uh, water snakes are great. Uh, the broadbanded water snake, what beautiful, beautiful snake there, where the pointer is. And I guess I'm finished. I'd like to answer any questions you might have. And maybe one question might be, why do you study snakes? And I can't put a, necessarily put a finger on that. I just love them. So when you love something, you, uh, you like to study them. So uh, Heather, are we here and ready to answer some questions? I've lost Heather. I'm not certain how to get Heather back. Maybe she's fielding your questions right now. Stan, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. So sorry about that. My internet went out. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know. What so, was I'm so sorry. I'm coming to you from my phone and I'm trying to see why my camera is not working. You know, technology is just always right. You cut out there also. Can the audience okay. still see me? Uh, they, they... Yes, they can still okay. see. You. So I've got questions and all they've right. got questions. So um, first of all, there was in the, one of the very first slides, you were talking about the collared lizard. Yes. And it was, I, you were, you were saying, oh, there's the male and the female. And I, man, I had to look really hard <laughs> to see the other one. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> I was like, man. Um, and then also the, at the, one of the early slides you were looking, or you were holding, I think a hellbender salamander and it looked enormous. How big yes. was that one? Uh, the hellbender, our new one, our newest, endangered species in Arkansas, 2011, I believe it was, was declared an endangered species. Uh, 
it uh, can get up to about two, a little over two feet in length and occurs in the Spring River and the Current River and the Eleven Point River in northern, northeastern Arkansas. And so that animal, you have to <clears throat> put on dive gear and go down most of the time in these rivers to find the animals. Uh, you cannot, like in the eastern part of the state, or uh, country rather, uh, the eastern hellbender, you can just wade up to your knees in, in many creeks and streams and turn rocks and find them there. Uh, not that easy in Arkansas, in most places. Uh, in Missouri, you have both the uh, Ozark Hellbender and the Eastern Hellbender occur in Missouri. And their challenges there are about the same, trying to find them. But uh, anyway, this is a very rare animal and it has uh, declined in populations due to, uh, I think, mostly loss of habitat. And you might say, well, how did, how was the habitat lost? Uh, uh, siltation, covering up the rocks that they uh, live under and maybe the removal of their, uh, their primary prey, which is crayfish. So yeah, that's, that's a, a very uh, important animal in, in the state. Try to keep so, it. Yeah. So Mark Christ had a question. Um, in those early slides, it seemed like all of the all of the snakes were named after dairy products, <laughs> and he would like to know if you know if there's a reason for that. I, th I think what happens with the milk snake, for example, is that they were they were initially found around barns, which is not surprising at all. They feed on lizards and smaller snakes and uh, and, and they tended to be in those sheltered habitats which barns provided. And uh, somebody got the idea that they wanted to call them uh, milk snakes. And uh, due to being around cattle, I guess, uh, maybe. And uh, there's a very, it's a very common snake in the Eastern US. Yeah, milk snakes. Cool, okay, so now I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize if everybody was looking at my under my chin. Um, if if Clifton Clifton had a question and apparently it has erased the chat in the process. Um, we're getting all I'm getting all kinds of fun stuff um, tonight that I didn't expect. So Clifton, you had a question. I think Bridget had a question. If y'all can retype those, that'd be awesome <laughs> because I can't see them. Um, so while they're doing that. If you can, you know, what if somebody's interested in going into herpetology, herpetology, yeah. you know, what, what do you, you know? Well, I let me, you, you want to ask, how did I get into it? Yes. Now you could say, well, he, he, he chased collared lizards when he was a kid and, and maybe collected snakes when he was a kid. Well, I went into college as a math major and uh, was that UCA? And, and I transferred to the U of A. And my junior year at U of A, well, I, I, at that point, I changed to a zoology major. But I took a class and called natural history. And it was a, um, a lower, uh, wasn't a graduate course, it was a lower, a lower um, degree, you know, bachelor's degree course. And my professor took me out of the class in the middle of the night, it was a moonlit night, I do remember that. And we went over toward Lake Weddington, out, uh, west of Fayetteville, and to a field, we had to jump the fence. And that was uh, interesting, but he obviously had permission, permission to get on the property. But we got out there and went to a pond. And we had our dip nets with us and some people got in this water and, used the seine and seined up some salamanders, uh, spotted salamanders to be specific. And that was it. I mean, I was hooked. <laughs> I, I just, I'd never seen that done before. I'd never done that. I'd never seen a live spotted salamander and uh, central newts were with them. And I, and that was it. Yeah. I, I said, this is, 
this is really neat stuff. If I'm going to be a zoology major, this is what I want to do. I'm not going to be a zoology major and be an oceanographer mm -hmm. in the middle of the country, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. even though I thought about being in, in oceanography. Uh, so I, I accepted that uh, challenge and have never looked back. Great. Okay, so now the questions have come into the chat. Thanks okay. to everybody for retyping them. <laughs> um, so Bridget would like to know, what is the best thing to do when encountering a snake? She says, we go hiking often and I'm scared of snakes and tend to freak out. So let me say, Bridget, I'm with you there. I told Stan when we were doing the pre-tech for the, the pre for this, I was like, Stan, I don't like snakes. <laughs> so what do people do when they... Well, most of the time, the snake um, sees you and it takes off. But the problem is with this lower group of lower right snakes down here, these are sit and wait predators. They sit and wait for a prey to come by. And they can be sitting on a path and not move. And you can be right on top of them and they don't move and you may not see them. And so uh, anybody that hikes must keep that in mind. I remember uh, distinctly doing a uh, survey in the uh, Washita's one year, and we had just walked a straight line through habitat, and I had just stepped over uh, maybe a rock or something, and I, and I sort of had a sigh of relief, you know, I'm, I'm trying to walk through the habitat and the, the guy behind me says hey don't look down but you have a timber rattler right behind you on the ground so i just missed him when i walked stepped yeah. over so <clears throat> uh the, the best advice is be careful mm -hmm. and be wise and uh do not try to uh harass the snakes just let them let them be yeah and uh most of all these other snakes so that you see here they're going to go. You're not going to see them. They'll take off. But the venomous ones, excluding the uh, coral snake, they just sort of like to hang out. Mm -hmm. and they're willing to, to um, put up a defense. Now, the snake, these, these snakes are not aggressive. They are defensive. A lot of people talk about maybe a cottonmouth being aggressive, you know, when it gets into its position with its mouth open. That's not aggression, that's defense. It's a defensive position, posture, not aggression. All of these, uh, the Western Diamondback, you know, the timber, they all get in that coil position. That's a defensive position. Yeah. If you get them in that, get, get, if you get, get the snake riled up like that, then you better watch out. Yeah, you don't want to be anywhere close to them at that point because they can strike. And their striking distance is not, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's about uh, how much that coil allows them to go out. That's yeah. it. I'm, 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 how much more than a foot? Foot and a half. Okay. Yeah. That's a foot too much. <laughs> yeah. Well, you just got to be careful when, the, when if you're going to walk through the, 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 the woods mm -hmm. in, in Arkansas and you're not wearing uh leggings of some kind sort of uh, chaps um something to protect you know high boots if you're not going to do that then you're just asking for the possibility of uh stepping on a snake and uh one of the venomous ones there they're gonna they're not gonna like that right so um and nick I probably mispronounced your name wrong and I'm so sorry because I think we're colleagues. Um, I think you work at one of the branches. Um, she would like to know what can we do in our backyards to encourage snakes? To encourage snakes? Yes. Oh, do what I do. I, I, I Four years ago when I retired, I bought a half a rick of wood. I have a wood pile in the back and then I go into the Ozarks and along the uh, gravel road, pick up a rock or two, flat rocks, mm -hmm. mostly flat, and bring those rocks back. That's a great way to, to create habitat. If, if you create habitat, you have uh, a good chance of keeping your snakes around. 
So in the wood pile, I've found uh, a southern black racer. I've found the eastern king snake, uh, the brown snakes, and I don't like the snakes around because I don't want them. Uh, some of them eating my lizards which I've also created habitats for lizards in and around my backyard pond. I have a small backyard pond for frogs, which is just totally delightful. Uh, you, you get breeding from about mid-April through uh, late, late June, early July of all kinds of frogs. And it's just fun to listen to them. And we got frogs all around the house, outside. <laughs> so can't bring them inside. Uh, and uh, just generally create habitat. And wood, rotting wood is a great habitat. You get some uh, wood and stack it like, like you would just stack it uh, like a cord and then let it rot. And the termites will come in and then the uh, feeders of the termites and then those predators of the feeders come in. So Susan would like to know, or Susan says three times I've seen king snakes eating copperhead, eating a copperhead snake. She um, says, is it a commonality for most snakes to eat another? Uh, king snakes, yes. Um, maybe a milk snake, maybe. I'm looking at all the snakes we have here. Uh, coach whip possibly would eat smaller snakes but that's about it I mean the, the most of the snakes are you know are very specific like the hog nose excuse me hog nose likes toads feeds on toads the uh, the mud snake aquatic snake the mud snake is feeds on sirens salamanders and tadpoles and uh, so uh the snakes are and uh, i mentioned the uh the scarlet snake feeding on lizard eggs you know very specific uh food items in many of these animals all the water snakes eat except the crayfish snakes all they eat are fish i love fish maybe some frogs some of them like the plain belly who eat frogs but uh, mostly uh fish like the diamondback water snake I've seen him try to eat a shad where its head spreads out so much you wonder how can he get that fish down its throat? But uh, that's what they do. Roy says, you mentioned that the brown snake eats slugs. Is it possible to mm -hmm. cultivate them in your garden to keep down the pests? What, we, so cultivate what kind of slugs <clears throat> to get the snake to keep the pest down? What kind of pests are we talking about? We're talking about rats or raccoons or squirrels oh. or I don't know. Roy, fill us in on some, give us well, some. The, first of all, the, 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 the brown snake only gets about uh, 12 inches long. <laughs> Very small snake. Yeah. And he eats slugs. You know. Oh, he says, he, okay. So he says eating the slugs, he wants to, the pests are the slugs. <laughs> so. Uh, well, I mean, that, they're, they're good about doing that. Yeah. What you have to be careful with with a brown snake is this, if you are cutting grass or trimming around your house, you gotta be careful because they're, they may be out sunning and uh, and you may may harm them or kill them by uh, cutting grass. You just gotta be careful. Mm -hmm. We see them, uh, they're around my house, around our flower bed. And uh, yeah. But they're not going to, what you have to do with uh, slugs or snails is just get snail killer. <laughs> but when you put those chemicals down, then you are leading to some kind of uh, toxicity to, toward the snake, you know, through the uh, food chain. Yeah. I hate yeah. to do that, but I don't allow my wife to uh, spray for nut, nut, uh, what is it, nut grass? Mm -hmm. um, by spraying, killing all the nut grass around my pond uh, because I don't want those chemicals to get into the food chain there yeah. to uh, harm the frogs, primarily the frogs. As a kid, we just used to pour salt on slugs. <laughs> but, uh, 
<laughs> it may you it just, may for an interesting experiment. Um, you just have to uh, to get rid of slugs. You have to get rid of those uh, moist environments for them, which they like to live in. So if you have uh, uh, lumber or wood around your house, uh, remove that. I mean, put it up in the in the backyard somewhere. I don't care where they live. You know, if they live up there. So Clinton would like to know where might you find a queen snake in eastern areas of America? Uh, many of the streams you can go to uh, North Carolina. Um, and what you what you do, I think they may be protected, by the way. So it's it's uh, they're certainly protected in Arkansas. And, uh, and but in the eastern U.S. Um, into Tennessee, parts of Mississippi, eastern Mississippi. Um, Any of those major streams and rivers that have lots of crayfish, you're more apt to find. You can, you can find a queen snake. Some 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 streams are very common in the in western North Carolina, for example, in Virginia, you can find them. Dallas would like to know: Have you seen or heard of a cross in a copperhead and a cotton mouth in the wild? So I no. guess crossbreeding. <clears throat> not not going to happen in the wild. Not going to happen. <clears throat> if you think you see a cross between a uh, copperhead and a cottonmouth, you probably got a water snake. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say, hate to say that. There's a meme in that somewhere. Because <laughs> water snakes uh, have. Uh, the broadbanded water snake, which we're looking right there at the at its head. Oops, uh, very beautiful animal. Now, I'm not pushing my book, but if people are interested in these animals, the, and, and I know you can go online and you can get all kinds of photos, but my my book, our our book, uh, has great photographs, uh, identification keys, uh, distribution actually dots in counties where they occur oh, okay. uh, so it's a good it's a, it's a good guide um, well i put links at the beginning of this and hopefully they're still there in everybody else's chat i put links but you can find them on amazon or your local bookseller um so yeah so check out both of you know both of your books um so we have a couple more questions sure. and then oh no we still have time okay um so can a venomous snake penetrate a hiking boot boot when biting? Probably not. No. Okay. That's the whole idea about wearing a hiking boot. Very good to know. Yeah. Like that. But um, it's above the hiking boot. If the hiking boot is only right. it comes up to your lower, lower uh, shin and the snake is actually going to hit you in your upper uh, yeah. shin or thigh, eh, you know, you got a problem there. Um, how many bites by venomous snakes occur in Arkansas each year? It's almost like um, how many deaths in the U.S. Mm. And I think it's been maybe between uh, uh, 10 to 15 in the U.S., eastern U.S. And that's mainly due to anaphylactic shock. People uh, are not, cannot tolerate the venom, you know. But most of the time, uh, my major professor at uh, Auburn had a small copperhead and it, he allowed it to bite him, bite him and uh, had to go to hospital, get any of them and uh, survived uh, quite well. But I mean, uh, we probably see um, maybe, um, I would say less, I don't know. I'm not an expert on the numbers. You could talk to a physician. But yeah, there's at least uh, uh, 50, I would say, bites per year in Arkansas, maybe reported, may, certainly less than that, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, and probably no deaths from copperheads. I've never been bitten by a copperhead, been bitten by uh, none of the venomous snakes, but all the other snakes uh, that bite, I've probably been bitten by them. <laughs> because you grab the snake, 
because you don't want it to get away and it's going to grab you most right. of the time unless you're wearing gloves. Is there a way to identify a shed skin? Very difficult because you can look at the, I've, I've never been a connoisseur of trying to determine who, who shed that skin. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell a keeled scale versus a smooth scale and I can then guess what snake it could have been. The uh, racers smooth scales and the, uh, and the rat snakes have keeled scales. Uh, hard to tell. I mean, uh, just you, you have to, even if you had the head of the uh, shed, uh, often very difficult. Yeah. Um, that's all of our questions. This has been fascinating. I don't think I'll have nightmares tonight. Um, I didn't have, I will tell you, I forgot to tell you, I did not have nightmares the other night when we went through, the other day when we went through this. Um, but, um, you know, we, I, over the pandemic, I had two snake encounters, one of, uh, I think a king snake or a rat snake that was living outside and he was fascinating. Like we, we would go, we called him Ted and we would go visit Ted every day. And, you know, in those early months of the pandemic, we all needed a little extra something to do. And then um, the night before Easter, um, there was a teeny tiny little snake in my kid's bedroom. Um, and that was, I had never smelled snake musk. Um, and for something that small, that smell was horrible and it, it took forever to get it out. I mean, it just- Then you, you would not like water snakes. <laughs> water snakes have the worst musk, just about of any, any snake. And so when I collect water snakes, I used to, uh, the, the end that you really wanted to secure was the tail end. So uh -huh. it doesn't, because it, what they start doing, if you just grab the head and the upper body, they'll start, flashing back and forth with their bodies and they're also pooping at the same time and you just get it all over you so yes. i i always try to grab the near the tail mm -hmm. and near the head and just hold on that way yeah always always yeah well and and you've caught thousands of snakes in yeah. your career but do you kill them i mean you well okay let me uh say that the Arkansas herpetology book is based on museum specimens mm -hmm. from throughout the country from Arkansas that people have come in and collected and taken those animals away and put them in museums. Yes, they used to call me Dr. Death at uh, Jonesboro at ASU because I was and have always been up until my retirement um, a believer in having animals to study mm -hmm. because if you can talk you can talk about all the animals all you want but if you don't have an animal in hand and you can examine it then you can't really say much about their anatomy their reproductive biology you know their food habits or anything like that so i uh for many many years i killed snakes i don't do that now as a habit mm -hmm. i have a permit to collect i as I mentioned to you um, when we spoke last, uh, I let a uh, Southern Black Racer go that I'd gotten <clears throat> in my backyard yeah. and let it go. Not in my backyard. I, let, I took it down a couple of houses <laughs> down, let it go in the woods because <laughs> they do eat lizards. Yeah. And so I try to keep my uh, race runner population um, up to par. Now, I'll, 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 maybe this last thing I'll say, I picked up a uh, race runner, which is a lizard uh, with its head bitten off. It had been decapitated. And I think that was a squirrel. That was my, because it wouldn't have been any other snake that eats those because it would have been gone. Right. And, it, you know, and this animal is active during the day and raccoons are not active during the day. Uh, what's the most active mammal? around in my backyard squirrels yeah hundreds of squirrels i've took one and released another one today that i trapped up by my pond because i have bird feeders up there mm -hmm. and they like to get in the bird as everybody does if you yes. if you have a bird feeder in your backyard and you have trees in your backyard you probably have squirrels mm -hmm. and you probably have squirrels getting into the 
to the uh, <laughs> sunflower seeds. Anyway. What are some extinct snakes in Arkansas? What kind? What are the extinct snakes? I mean, are there extinct in extinct? You mean like a was here and now they're gone? Yes. Due to declines. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in pretty good shape right now. Uh, we the, the the animals, the snakes that are here, have been here for some time, and we don't have any uh, other than going back to the Pleistocene. We don't have any. Uh, evidence of of snakes that were not uh, here uh, or that were here then and and we don't we still have most of the snakes um, but that's that's a that's an interesting question um, nothing has died out yep interesting yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Well, thank you again so much for this. Um, I've learned a lot. I think my husband will be happier that maybe I won't quite freak out as much. Um, I'll, I'll have my, I'll be buying your book to study. Well, let me, it. let me just say something about salamandria. Salamandria combines all of my field observations into stories. And I think there's over 140 animals in the book that some are active in the book, some are just present in the book. And uh, it came out of my uh, study in the mine shaft down there, Hot Springs. And I just said, there's something here. And I woke up one July, late July day uh, with it on my mind and I just began to write. Yeah. And uh, if anybody gets it, yeah, you'll have to wade through it. There's some parts that are a little slow maybe. But uh, it's, it's sort of a fun, uh, interesting uh, middle grade adult. Yeah. Yep. Well, great. Enjoyed it, Enjoyed it Heather. And Thank Audrey. you so much. And um, next Monday, you can come back um, to this and we, they'll, be, they'll be talking about pumped about pollinators. Huh? Um, so that should be fun because, you know, we all need Speaking of pollinators, I've seen one honeybee this year. That is just unbelievable. Uh, we used yeah. to have honeybees all over our uh, butterfly weeds, bushes, yes. and only uh, bumblebees this year. Yes. One honeybee, and it's very frightening to only see. And I haven't seen a monarch. We used to I have lots of tons of pictures of monarchs and caterpillars, not a single monarch yeah. this year, which is really sad. It is. It is. It's sad to see those things that are that used to be so common no yeah. longer. So well, thanks well, thank for the you. heads up, though. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you next week. All right. Thanks, Dan. Bye bye. Bye.